Please give him a very warm Ann Arbor welcome. Jared Krasaska, come on up. Thank you very much. Hey, everybody. How are you? Good. Good. Thanks for being here with me. My name is Jarrett, and I'm an author, and I'm an illustrator. I feel lucky that I get to write the words, and I get to draw the pictures for my books. I get to like, envision the whole thing. And I feel so very fortunate that my books get published, because then you know, people who I don't even know in places I've never even visited can read my books and know about them. And so I'm going to talk to you all this afternoon about how I get to be an author and an illustrator and how I write some of my books. And for me, it all started when I was a kid, right? Because when I was a kid, I loved to draw. And I don't, I don't remember a time in my life in which I didn't draw pictures or I didn't have art as a part of my life. And as, as a kid, I learned how to draw by copying the drawings of some of my favorite cartoon characters. Like I would draw Optimus Prime or I would draw Snoopy or the Ninja Turtles. And here are some of my favorite things to read when I was a kid. This was my most favorite book when I was a kid. I loved The Mouse and the Motorcycle. And I loved James and the Giant Peach. And I loved Bonicula. And I would get the Snoopy treasuries and the Calvin and Hobbes treasuries and the Garfield treasuries. And I think I read this book about nine times. Because when, when we were kids in the late 1900s, when there was when there was a movie, like you had to wait about three years for it to come out on a VCR. And so I, you had to relive things by reading about them. And I, I would go to the comic book store all the time, too. And here's the thing, but every now and then a teacher would challenge me to read a book that she thought that maybe I wouldn't like, knowing that I'd end up liking it. And you know what happened? I read that first Anna Green Gables, and I read the entire series which you wouldn't expect from the same person who was reading all of those superhero comics, but I loved both of those stories. And when I was in the third grade, I wrote a book for the very first time. I remember being in the third grade, and I remember my teacher teaching us all about brainstorming and organizing our ideas and writing a rough draft and editing and revising. And all of those lessons that I learned about when I was in the third grade, I use today for these books that I have I get published, you know, I, I have to brainstorm, I have to edit, I have to revise. So it all started here for me in the third grade. And my first book ever, right, we were, we were studying Greek mythology, so we had to write our own Greek myths. And I wrote a book about Hermes, because he's always been my favorite Greek god. And my book had a cover, it had a title page, clearly. As a third grader, I was concerned about my intellectual property. <laughs> so kids, write, write the copyright notice there in the front. And I was just, I loved it because I was telling a story with words and pictures, right? And now that's what I do for my job today. I write stories with words and pictures. And here's what I learned early on is that sometimes you might use just the words to tell the story, but likewise, sometimes you might just use just the pictures to tell the story. Now, the very last page of this book was the about the author page, <laughs> which read, Jarrett lives in Worcester, Massachusetts. He goes to Gates Lane School. He liked making this book. And I love that last sentence. He liked making this book because I just loved using my imagination, right? And that's what writing is. Writing is using your imagination but on paper. So as a kid, I'd come home from school and I would make my own book. So I wouldn't wait for this to be a school project. I'd get home from school. I would take out pieces of paper. I'd fold them in half, I'd staple those pages together, and I would fill those blank pages with my own ideas, my own words, my own pictures. So here are some characters that I invented when I was in the fourth grade. And there was an egg, a tomato, a head of lettuce, and a pumpkin, and they went to a haunted house together <laughs> where they were faced with this evil blender and an evil toaster and an evil microwave. And I'd make my own comics, too. So after school, on the weekends, whenever I had some free time, I'd use that free time to write and illustrate and draw and make comics, and I would share these with uh, my friends. And I loved entertaining my friends. And then I would make my own little animations when I was a teenager, too. So I would take a stack of blank paper, and I would draw that same character over and over and over and over again, and, and then you videotape each drawing with a camcorder. It's a whole other tech piece of technology, kids. And, and it would make it look like the character was moving. 
So I would make hand-drawn animations like this. I would also make stop-motion animations where you make a little figure and you photograph it and you, you move it a little bit and you photograph it and you move it a little bit and then it will look like the characters moving all on their own. And, but then this magical thing happened when I was a teenager. I was hired to be the cartoonist for the high school newspaper. And that was really exciting for me because I could, I could write these stories, I could come up with these jokes, and I would, um, I would, I would, they'd get printed in the school newspaper. So that meant the kids in my high school that I didn't know, the kids in my high school that I didn't know were reading and enjoying my stories. Like, and that, to me, that, the thought that I could entertain strangers, like kids I didn't know, made me realize that this is just what I wanted to do for my, the rest of my life. So what I would do is I would, um, I, I was, I was all, like, this is what I want to do. So I, would, I kept making books. There I am, I'm, I'm a senior in high school, and I'm still making books. So I went to college to study art. And I, I went to Rhode Island School of Design, and, and I wanted, this is the illustration studies building. But before anybody can study their major, we have to take these very basic classes where you're learning about color, and you're learning how different, different colors affect one another. There are warm colors, there are cold colors. You're taking drawing classes where the teacher's setting up still lives. You have to draw what you see before you, so we're learning about light and shadow, we're learning about architecture and perspective. And we had to take painting classes too where the teacher would set up still lives, we'd paint them, the models would come in and pose and we'd paint them. And so, but I really, since I really wanted to make comics, and my own stories, I, I would just make them on my own, outside of my coursework. But because I was learning about color and I was learning about light and shadow from those required classes, I began to paint my, my characters. And soon I was painting my characters all the time. Now every single semester, I took a different writing class because I was getting a degree in illustration, but I knew that I wanted to be the author of these books. So I took a, a class that was all about writing picture books, writing and illustrating picture books. And the big project for the semester was we had to write and illustrate our own book. And this was my book. It was called Hello, Said the Slug. This giant orange slug who wants to be friends with this kid. And as you could tell by that boy's body language, is not into this friendship right here. So I was so excited about this book. At, and it was my junior year. And, and I thought, well, the class was over. And I thought, well, I have this book. And my teachers liked the book, and I liked the book. My classmates liked the book. I used to work at this camp. I would read it to my campers there. They all liked the book. So I thought, maybe somebody who worked at a publisher would like the book. And if somebody at a publisher liked the book, right, they would publish it. And they would make all of those copies that would get mailed out to libraries and bookstores. And so I thought, why not give it a try? So I mailed my book out to a publisher. And I waited, and I waited. And I waited, and one day, that publisher, they wrote me back. And guess what happened? Did they like my book and publish it? No, they hated my book. They, <laughs> they mailed the book back to me. They wrote me this generic letter about how they weren't interested in the book, and that's called a rejection. <laughs> and I had one rejection, which is a great start. But I didn't give up. I mailed the book out to a second publisher and did they like the book? Yes. No. <laughs> that second publisher, they rejected the book. So, but then I mailed the book out to a third publisher. And did they like the book? No. No. <laughs> no. They also mailed the book back to me, said we were not interested in the book. But I kept trying, man. And I, I mailed the book out to a fourth, a fifth, a sixth, a seventh, an eighth, a ninth, a tenth publisher. But they all had the same reaction, which was, no, we don't like the book. We don't want to publish it. But I did not give up, and I did not quit. And I mailed that book out to an 11th publisher. And guess what happened? Did they like the book and publish it? They did not like the book either. <laughs> and they did not want anything to do with it. But so then I knew, though, <laughs> That I, you know, I liked this book, but as much as I liked the book, I knew that if I wanted to get to be a better author, I just needed more practice, right? So I kept writing, and I wrote another book. It was called Josh Had a Bad Haircut, and I was feeling pretty good about this book. I mailed this book out to a publisher, and did the publisher like this book? 
No. No, they rejected And every single publisher that I mailed this book to rejected the book. So now I'm getting all of these rejection letters, so I'm beginning to doubt my ability as an author. But I, I'm feeling more confident about my skills as an illustrator. So I thought, okay, these publishers don't like my stories. They don't like my writing, but maybe they would like my art. And then if they liked my art, then they would hire me to illustrate a book that somebody else wrote. You know, and there are a lot of books out there where the author is one person and the illustrator is a second person. I thought I could be, I could be the illustrator and maybe that's just how I get my foot in the door and get started. So I would take a painting of mine and I, I would put it on a postcard. And that postcard would have my artwork, my name, my website. And I printed up 80 of these postcards. I mailed them out to 80 different people at all of these different publishers. And of the 80 people who, re who received these postcards on their desk at their publishing job, how many of those 80 people got in touch with me? 30, 30 is a good guess, but, but fewer than that. <laughs> 15 is a good guess, but fewer than 15. Four, four fewer than four. <laughs> three, and fewer than three. Yeah. One is a great guess, but fewer than one person <laughs> got in touch with me. Zero, zero, no, nobody did. So I, I painted another picture, and I printed up another 80 postcards, and I mailed these 80 postcards out to 80 different people at all of these different publishers, and how many people got in touch with me? None. None, and so week after week, and month after month, I'd mail out these postcards, but I wouldn't hear from anybody. And it got to the point where I had been sending my books out for two years, and I had a folder filled with rejection letters. And I remember that feeling of, okay, it's almost the two-year anniversary of my first book, Rejection, which was, let's see, is there a date? It, my first book, Rejection, was February 23rd, 2000. It was Little Brown. Um, <laughs> don't forget these things. But I kept writing, because that's what I love to do. And I wrote a book called Goodnight Monkey Boy. This, this, it was very different. My other books had been more complicated. I thought, okay, this is going to be very simple, like one sentence per spread kind of book for very young readers. And then I painted this illustration, and then I put this illustration on a postcard, and I printed up another 80 postcards, which then got mailed out to another 80 people at all of these different publishers. And how many people got in touch with me? One person did. One person did. I remember I mailed these out on a Monday, and then that Thursday, I went to go check my email. And this is, this is still, again, this is the late, late 1900s. And back then, when one wanted to check their email, they had to turn on their computer because when, when us grown-ups were younger, we used to have to turn off our computers at the end of the day. And it took like 20 minutes for the computer to turn on. And then you would look for that little blue triangle which it was a, it was, there was this thing called America Online. And we used, to have to, we used to have to get our internet through the phone lines. And if you're wondering what a phone line is, ask your grown-up, because I don't have time to explain <laughs> all of the technology that we dealt with back then. But see, this is back then, we would get validated if a little computer voice said, you've got mail, like that we would feel good about ourselves. You know, now we just tap and click like and heart on things. But then the computer voice would say, you've got mail. And it was this editor at a big publisher. It was Random House. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's a big publisher. And this editor wrote, and she said, hey, I, I received your postcard. It was this image. And she said, I went to your website, which was a big deal because it took a long time to download pictures on the internet then. And she, and she said, I, it probably took her like 40 minutes to do. And she said, if you're ever in New York City, please let me know. I'd love to meet you and see some more of your stuff. So I called her the next day and I said, I'm gonna be in New York next week. This is crazy. <laughs> then I was gonna be in New York. So then I called up a few other publishers to say that I was gonna be in New York and then suddenly I had four meetings with four of the biggest publishers and like a month before that, I would, I would, I would call up the people who, sent, who I sent postcards to and one person said it would kind of be kind of a waste of my time to meet with you. I'm not interested in your stuff. And now I had four big meetings. And I went and I met with everybody, but with Random House, I left New York City with a contract for my very first published book. Well, in fact, you know what? That little brown 
Did I say that was from 2000? No, my first rejection letter was in like 97 because that contract came like at the very, very end of 99. So Little Brown, I guess, rejected my work a couple of times over the years. I guess that's what that was. And so anyhow, so Goodnight Monkey Boy was published. On, it was published on June 12th of 2001. Yeah, I guess, what's today's day? June what? I, I just, I missed his birthday again. Uh, so now I have, I'm about to celebrate the release of my 36th book. And that's a difficult number to say, 36th. I feel like I'm, th 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 I can't say, th try to say 36th. It's difficult to say. I'm just gonna like get something else out there so I can say 37th. Um, so let me tell you how I write my books. I'm gonna tell you all about how I wrote the Lunch Lady books. Hey, thanks for having me, it's the same cover. So when, when my first book was published, I went back to my old elementary school in Worcester, Massachusetts, where I grew up, and, and I was setting up my presentation with a slide projector. Not, I, you, again, that's a whole other conversation. These are like actual little things that were translucent. I went into a machine, because it was 2001. And, and I was setting up my slide projector and in the cafetorium. Does anybody here have a cafetorium at your school? <laughs> Do you know what a cafetorium, if, if you can surmise it's half cafeteria, half auditorium, right? Yeah? You have one? Okay, so while I'm setting up my projector and I looked across the room and I saw a woman from my past. It was my old lunch lady. <laughs> and I had not seen her since I was a kid. So I went up to her to say hello and I went up and I said, hi Jeannie, how are you? And she looked at me, and I could tell I was familiar to her, but she couldn't quite place my name. And she's looking at me, and, and she said, Stephen Krasowska? And I was amazed that she knew I was a Krasowska. She got the family name. She got the pronunciation correct. But Stephen is my uncle, who's 20 years older than I am, and she'd been his lunch lady when he was a kid. So she told me all about her grandkids, and I quickly realized I had never had a conversation with my lunch lady that didn't revolve around like the menu. And I also, it blew my mind because I didn't know my lunch lady had grandchildren because I didn't know my lunch lady had children because I didn't know my lunch lady left the school at the end of the day. I had this whole other life that I knew nothing about. I was kind of offended that she had been keeping that from me all these years. And it just, my imagination just got going. I thought, I bet a lot of kids might not know anything about their lunch lady's secret life. So what are they keeping from us? Like, what are their secrets? So I opened up my sketchbook and I began to brainstorm. And I brainstorm with words and I brainstorm with pictures. Mostly in the beginning I brainstorm with pictures and I'm trying to get to know what this character is going to look like. And I wrote a picture book, not a graphic novel or comic. A picture book because I only had one, that one book and I was working on my second book which also was also a picture book. And it was a picture book about kids who just wondered what their lunch lady did with themselves after school. Like one character thought maybe she was a taxi driver. And another kid thought, well, maybe she's an opera singer. And then yeah, another kid thought, well, maybe she's a spy who knows karate. And that to me, I thought, well, I like that character's idea best. You know, I thought that's the more interesting story to tell. So because I wasn't stubborn and said it has to be about this book, I thought, well, well, let me explore what these ideas are and what this is going to become. And I just, I didn't know what format the book would take. I knew it was about a crime-fighting lunch lady and I kept drawing the character. At one point I thought, well, maybe it's a chapter book. And then, and then that didn't really work out. But I kept drawing the character and brainstorming and I invented, um, other characters like her sidekick Betty and Terrence, Hector, and Dee, these, these three kids who have breakfast at the school. I invented all of these different spy gadgets that Lunch Lady would use, like the spork phone and the spatulacopter and the fish tick nunchucks, all of these things. And then I had a chance to be part of this anthology called Guys Write for Guys Read, where we were all asked to reflect on our childhood and how that connects to what we're doing as adults in children's literature and as a few, one of the few artists invited on, I thought, let me make something visual. So I found this comic that I made as a fifth grader and as an adult, I continued the story of Lightning Man and I remembered what I loved about making comics and what you can do with the action and the storytelling and the pacing. And I said, this is perfect for the story that I've been working on about a lunch lady who fights crime. And I pitched this book 
in 2005, and I know that because I wrote about it on my MySpace blog, and I still have that <laughs> entry. <laughs> and, um, and I remember sending it to the publisher in 2005, and in 2005, aside from the fact that most of you didn't exist yet, um, <laughs> Neither did kids' comics and, and traditional publishing because the publisher had no idea what to do with it. They had it for a whole year before they figured out a way of how they might be able to publish this, this graphic novel thing. But they eventually gave me a contract, and I was excited. Now I needed to get it, kick into high gear to produce that first book. And when you're a cartoonist or an illustrator or an artist, graphic novelist, whatever, whatever you call yourself, when you're drawing the pictures for a book, you need to know how to draw that character the same way every single time you draw them. I mean, you draw them so frequently that you can almost, almost draw the character without even looking because it just becomes so second nature. I've drawn this lunch lady character so many times that it's just like a reaction in my hands. <laughs> And you have to do research, right? When you're working on it, when you're an author. So I went and chatted up the lunch ladies at the schools I would visit. They were very apprehensive until they learned it was a superhero lunch lady. Then I got the VIP tour of the backstage of the kitchens. And I would just take photo reference of their industrial mixers and the serving areas. But you know, now I have to actually write the plot for that first book and when I'm writing a book, I use a device I learned about when I was a kid, which is the story mountain. So I figured, okay, what's gonna happen in the beginning of the story, and then the rising action, and the climax, and the falling action, and the resolution of the story. And it's pretty simple. I mean, like the climax is cyborg fight. I just needed to know where that was gonna fit in the story. And I make page after page of notes on what I want to tell in the story. Now, so I, I, and then the publisher came back and said, okay, we're gonna put these books out at 96 pages. So I lay out the book, I make 96 little rectangles and I try to figure out what event will fall on which page of the book. And then I'm working through my thoughts and you can see with these arrows, I'm thinking like, no, I'm gonna need a couple more pages or this has to go here. And I, every page starts off looking like this, a small thumbnail sketch. Because I have to figure out I have to get people to read the panels in order because I know that people will start here at the top left, they'll read from left to right. So I just have to lay out the panels so that people will naturally know which panel to go to next. And it's a very small sketch, which is why I photographed that little ruler next to it. So then I'll, I'll make finished sketches for every page. I'll also have a script. I'll have the script and the sketches. I'll send that off to my publisher. She'll read it, she'll think about it, and she'll write me an editorial letter. And in this editorial letter, she's gonna say, this is what I love about the story, and this is what I, I'm thinking is kind of falling short. So she'll push me to write a better book. And you know, I reread the letter, and as you can tell, I've highlighted certain things that she's calling out, and I'm making notes, and I have to edit and revise and make changes, but then eventually I could work on the final artwork. And here are the tools that I lay out on a little desk next to me when I'm at my table working. I use, use non-photo blue pencils, I use erasers, I have ink, I have brushes, and I, I, I'll draw with a brush, and sometimes I wanna get in some small detailed work and I'll use pens. And it looks like this. So I start by drawing what's called a gesture sketch. A gesture sketch is a very loose sketch. You're just trying to start out what the pose of the character is. And on top of that gesture sketch, I'm gonna sketch out the details of the character, like their hair, their head, their facial features, their clothes, and then I'll take out my ink, and I'll dip my brush into the ink, and I'll draw the finished line work. And I, and I draw with a brush because you get a very dynamic line when you draw with a, a brush. If you apply a lot of pressure, that line will be thick. If you apply the slightest bit of pressure, that line will be thin. And when this gets scanned into the computer, I'm gonna scan the artwork in at black and white, and the computer will not see that non-photo blue pencil. It's like magic, because I don't have to go through and erase all of the pencil marks on all of the pages. It would be a poor use of my time. I, I might wreck the art. So I bring it over to my scanner, and now on my computer screen, I'll type out 
the pieces of dialogue. I'll select the different shades of yellow and gray, all in Photoshop. And now there'll be all of these computer files for the 96 pages. They get sent to the publisher, and the publisher will print out one copy. And all eyes are on that one copy, and we're searching for mistakes. Like We want to find mistakes, because there will be a mistake here, and we don't want that mistake printed in all of the books that get distributed. So for instance, I misspelled a lot of sound effects early on. As you can tell, they're correcting me. That's how you spell Haya. Here she's saying Haya, which is like not the right connotation that I wanted to have in that moment of the story. So I'll have one last chance to make any corrections before these files are released to the printer. And I'm able to hold a copy of the book in my hand for the first time. And this is the most exciting step, because up until now, this has been thoughts and notes and sketches and artwork and computer files. It's just to be a book that I can hold in my hand. And from the time that I ran into my lunch lady to the day this book was printed and published, eight years had gone by. So it was several years of just brainstorming, just thinking about it, keeping ideas in my sketchbook, always going back to it. But then I went on to make nine other books. There are 10 books in the series. So there are 10 books. There are 96 pages each. Who's quick with math? How many pages did I make? Thank you. I was like, somebody. <laughs> it's 960. Yes, thank you. Yes, 960. Good work. And that's all of the artwork from all of the books when you stack them atop one another. And when I look at that photo of all of those pieces of artwork, that's a huge, huge chunk of my life. That's like my entire 20s, most first half of my 30s working on this book. Now, I'm going to show you a few things. So this is the cover. Here are some of the uh, other ideas I had for the covers. And I remember not thinking that was the right design. And, I, and you know, you make a bunch of different sketches and you submit them to the publisher and they are like, you know, this is the one. Like they, you, need, you need an outside opinion sometimes. Now, when I finished all of the artwork for that first Lunch Lady book and I was getting ready to hit send on the computer and have it all upload to their servers, her apron was gray at first. And I thought, I looked at it, I'm like, that's kind of drab. I, th I feel like it's missing something. So even though I had finished all of the art, I went back into each file and I changed her, her, her apron to yellow. And the reason why these books are printed in two colors, back in the mid 2000s when this publisher wasn't sure if graphic novels would be a thing for kids, they, they didn't want to print them in full color because it's the production cost is high. It's, a lot of, it's expensive to print a book in color. And they wanted to put out a couple books per year. So instead of pricing the book at $12, they wanted to price it at $6. In order to do that, they limited the color. And we chose yellow because of the iconic dishwashing yellow rubber glove that lunch ladies have. And that's I could place with yellow forever. Forever will have that color in my life. Um, OK, so there's lunch lady. You may have also seen Platypus Police Squad. <laughs> Anyhow, Comic Squad. I, I put them together with my friends Matt and Jenny home, and we give everybody a one-word theme. And then they make a mini comic based around that one word theme. There's recess, there's lunch, there's detention. And then one of the contributors is in this room, but I'm not gonna call them out right now. Um, I'm also the uh, author and illustrator of the new Jedi Academy series, which was pretty wild to get an invitation from Scholastic and Lucasfilm to continue on the series that Jeffrey Brown had started. Uh, and what really drew me to signing on for it, I mean, I love Star Wars, but I also, I got to invent my own characters. So they wanted me to create a completely new story arc with new characters. So I invented Victor Starspeeder and then his sister, Christina. And Victor is sort of hyperactive, doesn't, uh, isn't always fully in charge of his actions, which gets him into some hot water. And his sister is like a straight A student and can't deal with her brother's shenanigans. So when he transfers in to the school, she's completely put out. And I got to invent my own droid, which was really awesome because those were always my favorite characters. And this sounds crazy, kids, but like for work, what an author has to do, what research. I went back and rewatched all of the Star Wars movies on DVD because they hadn't been released yet on video on demand. Do you kids know what DVDs are? Yeah. Some of you, okay. Just, I don't know how far along we are now with technology <laughs> generations. So I went back and rewatched uh, the Star Wars movies. I've read all of Jeffrey Brown's books. I have books about the world of Star Wars on hand just so I can quickly reference an alien species or a starship. I had to go to Dagobah to train with Yoda. <laughs> I had to learn to ride a speeder bike. I went to, and I went to San Francisco 
to Lucasfilm headquarters and to just chat with the story team there. And um, I got to see some of the droids they use. These aren't, these aren't costumes. These particular things were used for lightings for stand-ins in the original trilogy. So instead of getting the, the actors there in the, in the costumes, they would use that for lighting. I get a little bit too close to them, obviously. But this is cool. This is also, this is a puppet from, a Yoda puppet from Empire Strikes Back. So you can tell it's more valuable because it's under glass. And like for work, I went out and bought Star Wars toys. Just, and you know, like I get to write Star Wars toys off of my taxes now, which is pretty fun. And it's true, yeah. And which was a conversation I had to have. But I'm like, yeah, no, no, I can really do this. Um, and my family thinks I got a little bit out of control with my purchasing, but I think it was totally worth it. Because it looks awesome in our backyard. You know who was not happy? My pugs were not happy with this whole Star Wars shenanigans. So they ate my Star Wars toys. And now I'm looking for a new pet. I'm not sure. I w yeah, not a good pet, though. Yeah, not a good pet. He's feisty. Yeah, he's feisty. Yes, that's a good word. He's feisty. <laughs> you get him on a bad day, and he's feisty. Yeah. Well, if he hasn't had his morning coffee. Yeah. Um, so this is what it looks like when I'm writing. Because uh, cause the, the Jedi Academy books are half journal entries and half graphic novels. And, and when I'm writing my graphic novels, it's like a movie script. So you've got the character's name and their dialogue, you know, descriptions of, of their actions. But now sometimes when you're writing, you feel like everything is just garbage. Sometimes you're feeling so insecure. And honestly, there are days where I think, like, I know I have 36 books out there, but I've been just tricking everybody all along into thinking I have any talent. Like, this story is awful. I'm never going to do another book again. Like, why did I even bother in the first place? And it kind of feels like this sometimes when you're writing. Oh, hey, Vader, what did you think of that last You have edition? failed me for the last no, 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 time. I, I do a better job. I do a better job. But that's what, why we have editors. They're there to point out when, when things aren't as awesome as you think they are. And they're also there to tell you that things are way better than you're thinking they are. <laughs> and so then after I write everything, you know, and the story's in great shape, I, work, I move on to the sketches. I, I create all of my sketches on a tablet now, on a surface. And then those get printed out. And then I make physical artwork. And then it looks again like this, where I'm sketching everything out in the non-photo blue pencil, and then sketching out the details. Now, I don't really work this quickly. You guys know this is sped up, right? Yeah? OK. So and if you look really closely, you'll see where I switch from a brush to a pen. And I mostly use the pen for like the character's eyes, because sometimes you don't have full control over a brush. And if, if you get those characters' eyes wrong, like the entire picture looks, looks off and incorrect. So that again, that artwork will get scanned in, and then I type out the dialogue. I digitally now draw the word balloons, select the shades of gray, and that all gets printed up in the book. And let's see, oh, going backwards. Um, so the first book is called A New Class, and the, uh, the second book in Victor's story is called The, the Force Over Sleeps. And that will be here in July, like the very last Tuesday of July. Now, I feel so lucky, right? Because now kids are reading my books. And they're making artwork based on my books, just like I made artwork based on some of my favorite cartoon characters. And kids are having birthday parties themed around my characters, or they're dressing up and reenacting scenes and posting them to YouTube, or, or decorating their Halloween pumpkins, or turning up to my book signings dressed as a lunch lady character. <laughs> You know, and then and Halloween I, is a big deal in my house, so I know how big a deal it is if someone chooses my character to dress up as them for Halloween. One family even made a baby room themed after a punk farm, and I just uh, the child is ten now, and I just met them, and they were way more chill than I had anticipated, <laughs> having had a baby room like that. Uh, and twice I got to see my name up in lights in Times Square because kids voted my books as one of their favorites of the year, but it all goes back to the fact that I was just a kid like all of you who I just love stories. I love reading stories and I love reading comics. I love making my own comics and making my own stories. So we have a couple minutes left. I thought I might take a couple of questions from the audience if you have any, and then I'm gonna draw some pictures, do some live drawing for you. Anybody have a question? Yes? 
Can you, oh, that's a good question. Can if you make a mistake when you're inking, you know what? I need to go back and re-photograph that's that my supplies that I use because I also use whiteout, and they still make whiteout. And do you guys know what typewriters are? Yeah. yeah, that's how that was like whiteout was like the backspace of the 1900s. Yeah. Can you use ink over whiteout? Or you can use ink over whiteout. Yeah. But what's really neat if you ever get to see original comic book art from 50 or 70 years ago, what's really neat is that. The paper will change color over the years. So that white paper will become yellowish or brownish, but that white out stays pure <laughs> white. And, and it's, it's really neat. So I, was at, I just got to see the Will Eisner exhibit in New York City. And it was amazing to see like, just, just how much white out and stuff like that in some cases. Yeah. My friend right here? What's your favorite book? What's my favorite book? The Mouse and the Motorcycle is my favorite book. And you want to hear something really cool? So, do you, so Beverly Cleary, you know, who wrote The Mouse and the Motorcycle, they're reissuing some of her books this fall, and I wrote one of the essays in the beginning. And so my name is on the cover. It's like Beverly Cleary, Louis Darling, and then Jarrett J. Krasowska. It's pretty neat. Yeah, pretty cool. You have a question? What's the favorite book that I wrote? Well, it's kind of like being a proud parent, you know? I, I do love them all the same. I can't choose one over the other, because also when I look at these covers, I think about where I was in my life. Like when I look at this cover, I don't just see the, a boy with monkey pajamas, I think oh, that was, I was 21 years old when I wrote that book, and I was 23 years old when it was published, and I was living in Boston with some friends, and it was like all my dreams come true. When, when the second lunch lady book, I was working on the second lunch lady book, my wife was pregnant with our first kid, and, and, and I, she was due any day, and every night I thought, if I just pulled an all-nighter, I'd be finished with the book. But watch, if I do that, she'll go into labor. But the book was due, the art was due. So then one night I did that. I sat up all night, all nighter, and I crawled into bed, and 30 minutes later, the labor pains kicked in. <laughs> but she knew I'd pulled an all nighter, so she actually like waited like a couple hours to wake me up before she said it's time. And now that's that eight and a half year old named Zoe in the other room. So yeah, I, I, when I see these book art, I think of like, you know, where I was in my life. What's my favorite thing to draw? Anything but cars. I just don't like drawing cars or mechanical objects. I like drawing like organic things, like, like people or animals or monsters or creatures. Yeah. My friend here? Or goblins. Yeah, goblins. Do you like comic books or? Oh, comic books can be normal books too. So comic books or you could say, you mean like, Books without pictures? No, yeah. yeah, books without pictures. I, I like, or chapter books, do you mean? OK, because chapter books can have pictures. You know what? I like books that tell stories with words and pictures combined. That's what I love. That's my favorite thing to do. Yes, my friend right there. When am I going to be signing books when I, when I finally stop talking? <laughs> and <laughs> go, go next door. My friend back there? Oh, how did I get on Absolutely Mindy's show? Are you uh, the young blogger that was tweeting? Yes? Nice to meet you. Um, so I, every Tuesday, I'm on the Absolutely Mindy show on Kids Place Live on Sirius XM. And so this is what happens. Sometimes the most amazing things can come from things that you think aren't going well. So in 2011, so I had been a guest on her show a couple times as an author. And in 2011, I was in Washington, D.C. for the National Book Festival, and I was scheduled to be interviewed by her. But Mindy had laryngitis, which is a real problem if you're a radio host. So she had two authors that she was scheduled to interview. And she said, well, why don't you guys just come on and interview each other? And the other author, by, by no fault of their own, they just didn't ask me any questions about my books. And I went away feeling really sad that I didn't even get to say the name of my title of my new book. But I was like, well, whatever, that was fun. And she called me up the next week. She says, that was really fun. Do you want to have like your own radio segment? And so now I've been on the radio with her every week uh, yes, for five, six years now. Yeah. So I thought, oh, what, what a bummer. I didn't get to promote my book. But now I've had like every week I'm on. So it's thanks for listening. Did anybody else here ever hear me on XM? Some of you, yeah? Yeah, it's, it's now if you if you don't have XM, you can listen to the episodes on my on my website too. Okay, anyone la one last question before we go and draw? 
you're like, no, can you just get along with it, Krasoska? All right, got it. <laughs> Did you find your phone? No, there's, someone's not finding. That is the sound of find my phone. That's not, unless someone is like, I'm going to have a really entertaining ringtone. Okay, so when I'm drawing my characters, I always, I sketch, I sketch everything out first. And I always draw just a couple of shapes. So there's this one character where the first thing I draw is an upside down teardrop. And then I draw a regular ended teardrop. And that is going to become the basis for this character. That is that character's head and torso. And now I will know where to put their arms and legs. And on top of this gesture sketch, the pose, I'm going to sketch out the character's hair. and their facial features, and their clothes. I can, but it doesn't come out this good. It's always like, it's like driving. It's always best if you're lucky. <laughs> yeah. So then once I have everything sketched out, I'm going to take out my ink. Now when I'm at home, I'm drawing with a brush but I just flew in this morning and TSA has all of these regulations about how much liquid you can come onto the airplane with, so I did not bring my ink. So I am using a marker. Now I'm able to come in and confidently put in this finished black line work because I spent all that time thinking and sketching out where everything is going to go. There is lunch lady. Okay. All right, I'm gonna draw another picture for you. And where did I put my other marker? Okay, so this other character that I've been drawing a lot, again, I start with a shape but not a teardrop. I draw an oval on its side like so. And then I draw a bell shape. And then That'll be the head and torso, and I'll now know where to put the character's arms and their legs and their hands and their feet and their eyes. Now, this is not a character that I invented, but one that I've been granted permission to write and draw for, which is pretty weird because this is one of the most iconic characters in all of popular culture. So sometimes I feel like I'm just making like fan art, but then I have to remind myself that like the Lucasfilm logo is getting stamped on it. So it's pretty wild. Is there anybody here who can do a good Yoda impression? Would you like to come up here and, okay, good. Because sometimes I ask that and people say yes, and then they, like, will you come up here and do the impression? And they say, no. Hey, what's your name? Come on over here, Evan. You can just just talk for like this can just like another fifteen minutes. Of just use the Um. Like a Yoda impression. Yeah, just a Yoda impression. Okay. Yoda, I am. <laughs> <laughs> Good work. Does anybody else want a chance to show off their Yoda skills? Come on up. And what is your name? Alex. You sure? Yeah. Okay. Um, this is like 20 minutes of filler for me. That would be great. Let's just do some Yoda impressions. I'll try. Okay, thank you. Size matters not. Excellent. <laughs> Do or do not. There's no try. <laughs> That's great work. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. One last thing before we go. I want to teach you guys a game that you can go forth and play when you're feeling really stuck. Because sometimes when you're staring at a blank piece of paper, it is very uninspiring. 
And, you know, I think my best ideas come from when I'm just doodling and drawing. So it's called the scribble game. And it's where somebody draws a scribble, and then you have to see if you can find a picture in that scribble. Is there anybody here who would like to come up and just draw a, a quick scribble? What is your name? Noah. Noah? Okay. On the count of three, Noah. Ready? One, two, three, and scribble. Okay. Thank you, Noah. All right. Noah has drawn. Did you, do you love the Smashing Pumpkins? Because I think you accidentally drew the Smashing Pumpkins logo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Smashing Pumpkins was a band in the mid-1990s. Does anybody here do a good Billy Corgan? No? <laughs> Let me see what I can make out of this. Okay, hold on. It is a weird bird. All right. Is there anybody else who'd like to come up well, now that you know what it is, right? Like, what else was he going to make us do? What is your name? Bridget. Bridget. Okay, Bridget. Ready? On the count of three, Bridget. One, two, three, and scribble. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, let's see. No, I think that's great. Let me see what I can find in this. Hold on. Hmm. Let's see. Let's see. I don't know how to turn it on its side. Okay, I'm not going to turn it on its side. Who else would like to come up? What is your name right there? Claire, come on up, Claire. All right, Claire, on the count of three, ready? One, two, three, and scribble. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's see. Let's see, let's see. I saw a Ninja Turtle. <laughs> a Ninja Turtle was a superhero comic series. Now, you guys probably know what the Ninja Turtles are. Nickelodeon paid a lot of money for you guys to know what the Ninja Turtles are. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. What is your name right there? Come on up. Ready? One, two, three, and scribble. All right, thank you very much. All right, let's see, let's see, let's see. I guess I'm delving into just licensed characters at this point. I'm not <laughs> making up my own things anymore. Okay. You're like, no, don't, don't. <laughs> my friend in the way back. <laughs> You're like, I'm not, I'm not here. <laughs> and what is your name? What's your name? Charlotte. Charlotte, here you go. Okay, ready, Charlotte? One, two, three, and go. Thank you. All right, let's see. It is a radish with a face. Okay. 
I don't know. Are radishes stinky? This is a stinky radish. I don't know. Well, I want to thank you all. So you guys, you, this, now that you know how to play, you guys can, can play all, all the time, you know? And, and now you could write a story about a stinky radish or that Snoopy, not Snoopy. Or you could write a story about a Ninja Turtle. Uh, or you could write a story about that dude. Or you could write a story about this weird and crazy bird. Well, I want to uh, thank you all. So